what's up everyone Dominic the primetime treasure hunter here welcome back to another video we're gonna do something a little bit different today keeping you on your toes you never know what you're gonna see when you come on this channel and this time we are going to do a feature in which I am going to dive a little bit deeper into an item that I found when I went out sourcing it's something that I found interesting uh, that I want to present some information to you about and then once we go into the history of it some more I'm going to show you uh, some information about how items related to it uh, resell and the item that I want to focus on is this one right here you might remember me showing you this uh, a few weeks back when I went out sourcing this is at the a grocery store treasure hunt video uh, it was right after uh, I had gone uh, that day and I had done um, some sourcing off of a Craigslist ad that I had set up and I purchased a bunch of uh, stamps and some postcards and one of the postcards that I found and I actually highlighted it in the video is uh, this one right here and I'll link to that video at the very end of this one if you want to see the original uh, where I found this and uh, I thought this was a really cool postcard it says see rock gate and have a new experience rock gate is located 27 miles southwest from Miami on Key West Highway and then it shows this man here who made the place and what I want to do now is dive deeper into the man, the mysterious man uh, that made this place, which back then was called Rock Gate, but now is called Coral Castle. For those of you who live in Florida, uh, this is a place, as I will show you later, that you can still go to now and see. This is an entire uh, amazing structure that is built out of mostly limestone and it is considered uh, Florida's uh, Stonehenge is what they refer it to. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing uh uh, accomplishment what this guy did so let's get into it and I got a little presentation here uh, that I put together for you so uh, let's get into it here this is the man uh, the mysterious Edward Leed Scalman now just as a little disclaimer uh, I am providing you a basic summary kind of like the nuts and bolts and if you're still interested in this topic you could take it from here and you could find out all sorts of other information about this guy as you will see uh, although the average person has never heard of him before and does not know uh, who he is, uh, there are um, a bunch of people who are really, really uh, dedicated to researching him, researching the things that he has done, and there have been uh, books uh, written about him as well, uh, if you want to dive into it even deeper than what this video is going to do. But uh, Edward, uh, to take it uh, back to, um, you know, just really, really uh, the very beginning. Uh, he was born in Latvia, so he's, he's uh, from one of the uh, Baltic uh, countries, as you can see there, uh, right next to uh, Russia. And there's not much known about Edward's uh, childhood. Uh, he has a fourth grade education, but, you know, it's it's different back then compared to now uh, people who you know had a fourth grade education versus you know now if someone has a fourth grade education they're typically not going to go very far uh, but back then it was different uh, you know people uh, could pick up books and become self-read and pick up a trade and they could be very successful in life not that that can't still happen nowadays but it's definitely much more common back then now this obviously is not a photograph of back then I just put a picture up just to uh, give a little uh, pictorial example of, you know, some someone in the, you know, around the fourth grade, uh, uh, you know, type of classroom setting. But um, as I was saying, you know, you could pick up a book and you could read and you could uh, pick up lots of books and read and learn all sorts of things. And that's what Edward did when he was a kid. Uh, he loved books. He loved reading. He loved, um, you know, just learning uh, historical types of things. And um, there's indications that he did also, as he was older, work with his uh, father and uh, pick up some 
uh, important information about stone masonry. And so uh, it's believed that he did work uh, by his side and picked up uh, some of these skills as he was uh, younger. And this is what I was referring to earlier in terms of the importance of uh, back then. You know, you could pick up a trade and be very successful uh, without doing much in terms, of, uh, in terms of school or formal education. Now, as he got older... Uh, when he was 26 years old, he was engaged to a woman named Agnes Scuffst. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but that's uh, what it looks like, how you would say it. Uh, but unfortunately for poor old Edward, uh, a day before the wedding was to take place, uh, Agnes broke it off with him. And um, from everything that uh, we've been able to uh, piece together, uh, he was pretty heartbroken about it. And um, he has uh, referred to a past love of his as his sweet 16. Now, many people uh, believe that that reference is to uh, Agnes, but there have been some people who have researched Edward and uh, believe that it is uh, related to Hermine uh, Lucis. Now, you may wonder why the heck are you showing me this kind of stuff? How is this even related to this guy's castle? Well, I'm going to tell you, trust me, there is a relationship. So we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But um, then in 1912, specifically April 17th, 1912, Edward moves to the Pacific Northwest, specifically in the Oregon area. And what's going on in the Oregon area at that time? Well, for all you Oregonians, you know the answer to that. There's a lot of logging that is going on. I love these old pictures, by the way. They're so cool. If you ever found like old postcards or old photos uh, with something like this, you know, with guys working uh, on the logs, uh, the, these types of things just by by themselves uh, will sell well. They'll resell well if you find anything like this. But, you know, cool picture. And, you know, he learned a lot back then uh, working with these um uh, you know, people in the logging industry, because as you can imagine, you know, you see all the cables there and you see some machinery. Um, those those logs are absolutely huge. I mean, they dwarf these men. Uh, you know, all those men are standing on one log. So they needed to use some type of uh, mechanical principles to uh, be able to maneuver these massive logs around, uh, you know, in order to uh, work and to do their trade. And so uh, he must have picked up on uh, a lot of different techniques back then, which would become important later on as he had to start moving these limestone uh, boulders and, and structures around to build his castle. And um, before Edward wound up getting over to Florida, um, you know, as I said, he was in the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, he uh, eventually had developed uh, tuberculosis. Now, this, again, is not actually a picture of him, but this was uh, what it looked like back then. If you were in a TB ward, uh, they treated pandemics different back then. Uh, you could see there's not a very good social distancing uh, going on there. So a lot of people did die. In fact, uh, Edward was told that he had a terminal illness at that point. And so what he eventually decided to do was to move to warmer weather. And that's what eventually brought him over to Florida. And uh, he started to, uh, you know, try to, uh, you know, recover and, um, you know, isolate himself. And you will see in 1923, uh, based on research, there is actually a publication in the Homestead uh, Enterprise that says Edward uh, Lee Scalnan, uh, a Californian. So he was you know, probably in multiple uh, areas uh, over in, in the Northwest and on the West Coast, um, has purchased an acre of the R.L. Moser homestead and is planning to erect a home soon. Now, R.L. Moser's wife actually helped to nurse uh, Edward uh, back to uh, recovery. Now, um, there's all sorts of theories in terms of uh, explanations, in terms of how Edward actually uh, got better. And uh, there is this belief out there, and it's one of the reasons that Edward has these, uh, um, you know, very um, dedicated uh, people who follow him and uh, test out his theories uh, because he would talk about that he had these powers of magnetism. And so there are some theories that um, the powers of magnetism is what actually cured him uh, in Florida. Now, when he was 
looking for a place to settle down. Uh, people describe uh, the scene of him actually walking around and kind of tapping structures on the ground, and people were asking him, "What are you? What are you doing exactly?" And he would just look and reply, reply back, "I'll know when I find it." And people theorized that he was looking for an area of land that had certain magnetic qualities, possibly based on things that he had learned uh, in the past. Because some people believe that he used uh, some type of knowledge about magnetic forces to help him eventually move these uh, big giant structures around uh, that he uh, wound up uh, you know, coming across in terms of all this limestone when he built his uh, uh, castle. And so this brings us back here to the next 20 to 30 years in Florida City. Uh, and then later on, he actually, not only did he build this, uh, this structure, this rock gate structure in Florida City, but he started to become concerned about his privacy. And so he eventually wound up over the course of three years loading these structures onto a truck and moving it over to Homestead, Florida, and then reconstructing it over there. Now, he hired a trucker, and he did not let the trucker actually put the stuff on the truck. He put the stuff on the truck. He was very mysterious, and this this mystery, this, this mysterious quality of him, you can even see he looks mysterious. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Rod Serling from the, uh, the Twilight Zone, you know, standing there at the beginning of the episodes. Uh, so he is... Uh, said to have only worked at nighttime. Now, as I'm going to show you a little bit later in an unearthed video clip of him, uh, there uh, actually uh, is at least one instance where people have uh, did see him working actually during the daytime. But uh, for the vast majority of the times, he worked secretly at night if he thought that anyone was actually looking over uh, you know, a gate or looking over, you know, to the stone wall or anything like that to see him, he would actually stop working. And so, uh, you know, he, he really very secretive. If anyone ever asked him how it was that he built this, he would never, ever explain it. He never really wrote down the explanation as to how he uh, did uh, what he, what he did. Uh, he would just say, it's easy if you know how. So he would often give these just mysterious um, uh, explanations to how he did things. And th these are actually some pictures of him at work. Um, and you could see there on the uh, left, there are those giant um, uh, um, lumber uh, structures there, uh, you know, these big timbers. And um, there's some metal devices that are attached to it. And uh, you could see over here uh, to the right, again, um, something made out of a combination of wood and metal. He used to use uh, auto machine parts, uh, all sorts of things that he could kind of salvage and put together uh, to make devices that would actually wind up uh, moving uh, these um, these limestone structures around. And you could really see there, especially on that picture to the left, the influence of his time uh, in those uh, logging days in the Pacific Northwest that would have helped him uh, figure out how to uh, construct these types of things and, and put them together to help them uh, or to help him actually move the uh, boulders around. So 1936 is specifically when he moved over to Homestead, Florida. And you can see here are some close-ups of the actual place. And these are actual pictures uh, of Edward. You could see there, there's that crescent moon structure uh, that he made. He also made a sundial, which is actually located near the crescent moon shape, uh, that actually tells the time accurately within two minutes. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating that he was able to do that. Again, you could see there uh, to the right, there's one of these uh, wooden uh, timber structures that uh, he built to use as some kind of uh, a tool to help him uh, in terms of the uh, construction. Again, uh, the vast majority of everything that he um, uh, built here was made out of limestone. Now, uh, again, um, he would give these kind of mysterious answers to things. Here's another answer he would sometimes give when people asked how he did what he did. He said, I understand the laws of weight and leverages and, and leverage, and I know the secrets of the people who built the pyramids. And so uh, 
Um, this would maybe be something he picked up during his uh, readings, maybe something that he had learned uh, over at the Pacific Northwest, but he claimed to uh, have this uh, special uh, knowledge. There's a picture of the uh, pyramids of, of Giza, and um, you know that would actually be um, you know something he would refer to as the Great Pyramids and knowing the principles about uh, how those uh, things were made. Now, I'm sure you know there are some people who theorize that uh, it was impossible for people to have built the pyramids back then and aliens must have helped out. And in fact, the story of Edward uh, Leeds Skelman and his, uh, um, his, his coral structures, his coral castle, actually was a feature story on the TV show Ancient Alien. So you can actually watch that clip if you want to uh, on YouTube, if you look it up. There's lots of uh, uh, videos uh, on Edward. Now, people would also ask him why he did this. Why did he spend 20 to 30 years building all this stuff and laboring away? And what he said, his answer was that he built this as a homage to his Sweet 16. So, uh, one of his lost loves, either uh, Agnes or the, the other woman who I, who I showed, uh, this is supposed to be something that he constructed all in dedication uh, to this uh, woman. And so this is actually a, sort of a love story for those of you who like love stories. And I'm going to show you actually later on how this uh, uh, story actually relates to a a song that many of you probably know uh, in in pop culture, and um, maybe surprised to know that this is actually the story behind it. So I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, I've shown a bunch of uh, black and white photos, but this place is still open today. You could still go there and go see it in uh, Homestead, Florida. Uh, this is actually um, uh, now been. Uh, purchased by a, a, you know, a separate company. It's not in the family anymore. Um, and so uh, they do tours and all sorts of things. I'll actually show you the website a little bit uh, later once we get out of this. But you could see here's the entrance and uh, it, show, it does say correctly, you will be seeing an unus uh, unusual accomplishment. That is absolutely true. This is Rock Gate. That is the name on the postcard that I showed you earlier that I found. And uh, this gate is made out of about nine tons of limestone. And as you'll see a little bit later, this is something that you could actually just move he had built it so precisely that you could just touch it with your finger and this nine ton boulder would actually just move around and, and open and you could actually walk into the uh, into the castle that way. Now, it, it, it was like that until around the early 1980s when it actually uh, came off of its pin set and they had to bring in heavy equipment operators who then... Uh, tried to reset it, but even this is the funniest thing about this is that with even with modern technology, and you have these people with these heavy equipment crews that come in, they could not get it set the way Edward Lee Scallon had had this thing set. So that's how amazing, like the handicraft of people back then compared to people now, like the artisanship and the craftsmanship. I mean, if you even go back, if you like to watch uh, one of my favorite shows on TV, uh, The Curse of Oak Island, the stuff that the Knights Templar used to build, like the stone masonry skills, absolutely incredible. And unfortunately, a lot of that knowledge has been uh, lost uh, these days in terms of people being able to replicate this type of stuff. So amazing amazing stuff here's another uh, picture of the uh, the crescent moon shaped uh, structures that he made uh, there's some other areas uh, there's like a little garden area uh, that he has as well there and here's another image as well just a little bit more of a close-up a little bit more of a clearer picture of that uh, this is actually really cool uh, people refer to it as the telescope it's a it's a 25 foot 30 ton structure that he made and it is perfectly aligned with the North Star. I mean, that is just amazing. It just blows my mind that someone's able to uh, do something like that. Again, you know, back back then, I mean, we're talking the early 1900s, where you just don't have the type of equipment that you have uh, that you have these days. And he was able to construct it. This is an overhead view of the current location, uh, and you could really get a better sense there with the aerial view of just how big this place is and how magnificent it is. It actually is currently listed on the National Historic Places. Uh, list. So this is considered a culturally significant place that this man built.
with. A absolutely just amazing. Totally fascinating. Uh, here's some other um, you know, cool pictures here. He made these uh, little rocking chairs and stuff. So some of these actually do rock uh, back and forth, or at least that they, they used to. Uh, pretty cool. You can imagine uh, hanging out there, having some barbecue maybe, you know, some ribs, some chicken, some steaks, maybe fry those up, uh, you know, put a little barbecue there. That would be cool. Um, and, some, and actually, I joke, but you actually can rent this place out right now if you want to. Uh, if you want to have weddings there, parties there, uh, you know, ceremonies, you can do that. And I, I bet there, there have been people who have done that. Um, you know, I wish I would have went there when I used to live in Miami. I used to work in Miami and um, it would have been a great place to go and see. If I ever go uh, back down there, uh, I definitely am going to go stop by, check it out. Uh, so, unfortunately, um, you know, Edward passed away in 1951. He had a lot of different medical conditions. He actually um, died at the hospital I used to work at, the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital. Um, he left one day, he put a sign on his uh, castle, said, I'm going to the hospital, and unfortunately, he never came back. But uh, when they did go afterwards and look around the castle to, um, you know, find things, uh, you know, that he had and just kind of take some inventory and stuff, they did find a piece of paper where he wrote down, the secret to the universe is 7,129, and now presumably that's a division sign, uh, looks like we've got six one zero five one nine five so six million one hundred five thousand one hundred and ninety five so uh i don't know what that means um you know i think that a lot of what he was doing is that he was just creating mystery now when they went and they, you know, and it's good for marketing, you know, back then he, they found that he had around $3,000 on him at the time, which was all money he made from admissions. He initially charged 10 cents to get in when he had it at the Florida city location. And then when he went over to the homestead location, he started to charge 25 cents because people were coming in and they were, you know, damaging his shrubbery and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, he was trying to just, you know, increase the uh, charge a little bit. Hopefully people would be like a little more respectful of his stuff. He actually used to give free tours uh, at certain points uh, as well. So this is the song I was referring to in pop culture, Billy Idol's Sweet 16. A lot of you know that song, a lot of Billy Idol songs in the house. How many of you Billy Idol fans that knew uh, or know this song knew that this was the story behind it? Uh, you could see there the lyrics, I'll do anything for my Sweet 16 and I'll do anything for little runaway child. Because remember, she supposedly uh, ran away the night before the uh, the marriage the marriage was to take place. Um, gave my heart an engagement uh, an engagement ring. She took everything everything I gave her. Oh sweet sixteen, built a moon for a rocking chair. Those pictures I showed you earlier is what that refers to. I never guessed it would rock her far from here. Oh oh oh, someone's built a candy castle for my sweet 16. So that is the, all of those are references to Edward and his lost love or his ideal love and, um, uh, and, and the castle that he wound up, uh, building. So, uh, that's the end of that, but I do have some stuff I want to show you uh, online. Um, by the way, if you go to actually, if you actually go to Billy Idol's uh, YouTube page where you go to his uh, videos, you'll actually see this is the very beginning. So that's that postcard that I showed you earlier to begin with. That's the picture he has in the beginning to introduce his video. So that's why you see that. If you ever watched that video before and wondered who the heck is this guy, why is he in here? That's the story behind it. And by the way, this is the Coral Castle um, website. If you go to it right now, uh, coralcastle.com, uh, uh, you could go see here. There's the telescope uh, that I was showing you earlier, that uh, big 25-foot, uh, 30-ton rock where you could go and you could they do ghost tours and all sorts of stuff. Of course, that stuff's probably shut down right now due to the coronavirus pandemic, but when things uh, when the dust settles, uh, this stuff will be open again and people could go there and go check that stuff out. Now, so I told you all that interesting history and stuff, but how does that relate to reselling? Well, let me show you a couple things that would relate this to reselling. So Edward did write uh, five 
uh, books and he would put pamphlets together and he would sell those and he would make some money from that as well. So part of that $3,000, by the way, that I mentioned, it wasn't purely from admission fees, but it was also partly uh, from selling uh, his, his works, things that he would write. Uh, and this is a book that he wrote called uh, A Book in Every Home. And uh, you could see this is, uh, this is the original uh, book right here. And um, this one was from 1936. And one of the things uh, that I'm going to show you about the book that was uh, interesting that he did is you could see here, he's got some pictures of himself in here. So people love to get these for, you know, for those old original pictures. But you can see right here, we have a blank page. And the reason why he put a blank page in there was because his philosophy was, if you read my book, you read, and there are words in here, but if you read this book and you don't like the things that I'm saying, well, here you have a page to write some, you know, something else, something opposite. You know, if you disagree with what I said, here you go. If you think you could do it better, then there you go. I'm giving you a whole page to write something that you think is better than what I put together. So there you go. And there you go. You can see here a book in every home. He talks about his sweet 16, but he also talks about political views. He talks about uh, domestic views and you can see they're published in Homestead, Florida. Um, now, if you were to have ordinarily seen this before watching this video, this might be something you would just walk by and think, well, eh, this doesn't really have any significance to it. And you can see here where I'm talking about that there are you know words in here it's not just all pictures and you can see there's uh the copyright date uh right there as well now this one sold for 35 dollars plus two dollars and 80 cents shipping um th this book doesn't really come on the market that often but um, as i'm going to show you a little bit later make sure you do a deeper dive into your market research on items you really want to go into terapeak and go and do a search for a year's back worth of comps because what you will find out is this book will actually, it can actually sell for um, higher than this $35, in fact, much higher. Um, but you know, if you don't know that and you just say, all right, I guess I'll just throw it up for $35, then you could be underpricing your item, especially if there's not another one uh, on the market. If you ever come across, you know, I talk about all the time, you know, these ephemera type of items, they're called ephemera because ephemera refers to ephemeral, meaning that it's not supposed to be something that lasts long. And this isn't something where they have many of anymore, but you can see here, this is an old advertisement, old pamphlet for the Coral Castle. Really, really cool piece. This is the type of stuff that I just love. People love just going back into the nostalgia. And you can see there, uh, back then the admission was a dollar, a dollar fifty. So it had it had increased at some point, but. A really, really cool piece. This one, uh, you know, it didn't sell for a ton of money, but, you know, if this is something you get in a giant paper lot where you just paid a couple pennies for it and you sell it for $12 plus $4.65 shipping, that's not bad. That's a first class item. It's just going to cost a few bucks to ship out. Uh, no big deal. You know, it works out to about approximately like a $10 profit on the item if you got it for cheap. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are some books that have been written uh, about Edward uh, Leeds Skelnan. Uh, this one right here, The Secrets of Edward Leeds Skelnan uh, Revealed. Uh, this one is sold for about 20 bucks. There's still a couple available, so they sell every once in a while uh, for that price. He also wrote some other things. He wrote some manuals. Um, uh, he wrote things, for example, on his magnetic current theories. Uh, so... Uh, these uh, don't sell for a ton of money. These are actually um, reproduced versions, as you can see here. These are more modern versions of someone taking what he wrote and just making it into a nicer uh, version. There are some uh, works out there. Uh, Don, the auction professor, I've been talking about this recently. Go follow Don, by the way, on Don's channel. I was just on his tonight. We had a good time on the Don and Dom show. Uh, there are actually public uh, works out there that you can actually take and you could... Um, you know, reproduce them legally and you could package them however you want to. And then you could go sell them. Usually you don't make a ton of money on those types of things. And uh, I'm not actually certain if this is an example of that, but it might be. And um, this is an example of someone who uh, could have put something like this together and, you know, sells them for like 10 bucks plus a couple dollars uh, shipping. This was the Terapeak um, I was referring to. If you're not familiar with uh, Terapeak, uh, what you want to do here is you want to go to... 
um, the advanced tab and oh, not the advanced tab. Sorry, you want to go to your you want to go to your seller hub, and then you are going to go to research, and um, you're going you're going to see a Terapeak link right there, and uh, you're going to just click uh, under. So it says 365 days, so you can get a year's worth of data there. And what you're going to see right here is that we've got um, one item here that sold for $200 plus $10 shipping. I know it's going to be a little hard for you to see, but uh, this is the Coral Castle um, <laughs> Rockgate uh, 8mm film of Edward Leeds Scallon. So if you could find, if this is why, you know, it's one of the things Don talks about too, is that if you find film reels, if you play them and you recognize what it is you see, so if you got a film reel, put it on, and you start to see those coral structures there, you might otherwise just, you know, say, ah, what, what, that's not a big deal. But now after seeing this video, if you didn't know about this before, you would know that and realize, wow, this might be something that's worth a lot of money. So anything like that, any old film of Coral Castle or that has Edward Lee Scallon in it, that, you know, could go for a pretty penny. So that one went for $200. Uh, this is another um, a copy of the Edward Lee Scallon, a book in every home. Uh, plus it had the magnetic current one. And these might be some uh, originals especially the magnetic current one might be because that bumped the price up to a hundred dollars um some people put lots together so uh rock uh, gate coral castle two booklets and 13 postcards that was 92 dollars and uh here's another example of the 1936 edward Leeds scallon book this one um sold for 60 dollars plus 275 shipping this is the exact same book as the one that I showed you over here. Uh, over here, And this is what I mean about making sure that you're doing your comps research and checking that out properly, going back, making sure you're looking at a year's worth of data. And you could sort it uh, by just pressing average price, and that will show you the highest prices uh, that sold for the item. So I would, if I found this, I would price this up, put it up there around that $60, $70 range, see what happened with it, especially if I had no competition uh, on the items. So, uh, you know, that's almost double uh, the price of what this person wound up getting for it. Now, and then it goes down from there, but there's actually multiple uh, examples of that same book selling for, you know, somewhere around that price, 60 bucks, here's uh, $40, um, plus it actually says 59.30 shipping. I don't know if that's an error, but... Um, uh, you know, there's some other ones here that sold for, you know, well, there's the $35 plus 280 shipping. So, uh, here's one that sold for $40 plus 275. But so the point is, you know, it could sell for a little bit higher. Um, so that brings me to, um, um, my postcard, which I have here. And, uh, this one I currently have listed for 4750. I have three watchers on it right now. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, and it is the truly is a rare postcard, you just don't. I've never seen an example of this postcard uh, with him on it like this, and with that advertising, that promo. Uh, I think this is a, just a beautiful piece, and um, you know, someone who uh, collects his type of stuff is gonna really enjoy this. Um, or if you just liked it because of watching this video, I'll put the link down in the description section for as long as it is. Um, uh, it is up and um, you know if, if you're interested in it just let just let me know so um, I want to end this off with a uh, interesting little video clip here that I found I actually found it on on YouTube and if you've been wondering all along well how, yeah it is very interesting that he made this stuff but how the heck did did he do it this clip um, it gives a little bit of an um, a little bit of an example of the kind of stuff that he was doing I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger and I'm gonna play this and you could see him actually doing a little bit of work during the day so I'm gonna press play here so it's it's silent film and there you could see those three, um, um, there was those little wooden structures. There he is right there. Look at that. He's actually pulling down. So he's really using, as you can see here, he's using a lever and pulley system uh, to maneuver these big things around there. There you could see he's basically using like a jack, uh, essentially, which is, you know, the kind of thing that you would use to, you know, there you go, right there. He's just jacking it up. And there you go. He's slow. That's how he's moving it. He's moving it across along like that. And this is why it just took like 30 years. And, um, you know, it's just a long, laborious process. There's an example of what I was talking about. That little tiny kid just pushed open a nine-ton boulder. 
Um, I think the reason why Edward was walking around and doing this stuff during the day, even though it's you know written that he never really did this, he always did stuff at night. There's the kid closing it. Um, and there you could see the moon crescents there. You could see the rocking chair down there, people having fun. They're probably having some ribs and some chicken and some barbecue like I was talking about earlier. There you go. Um, you can see there's a lot of uh, a lot of ladies there. I think Edward was uh, trying to attract the ladies. I think... Uh, you know, this was like a, a you know a chick magnet for for Edward there. You know, uh, there's there's you know he had this this guy over there. He's flirting with the ladies there. Um, uh, that's what I think uh, was really going on here. I think he was <laughs> partly joking, but you know uh, who knows? I mean, it was a, a labor of love, that's for sure. This is funny. I get a kick out of seeing this kid moving around back and forth and rocking in that little boulder and having like the greatest time in the world. Show your kids that the next time they're bored, uh, you know, when they when you take them on an exciting ride in a theme park, you know. And there, there we go again. You know, here we go. You know, Edwards, he's luring these ladies in here. He's giving them bats and stuff and. Uh, you know, uh, it's just um, I I think he's trying to impress them. Look at him; he's got he's got the uh, th they're having a blast over there. You know, there's like you know that's uh, uh, he's ha he's having a lot of fun there. I could tell. So anyway, there's a lot of stuff that you could see. There's a lot of videos you could watch on him. There's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of things you could you could read. Uh, just type his name in into Google, and uh, you know you'll just see tons of stuff there on him. So uh, to me, um, I, you know, I had a lot of fun putting this together. I thought it was really interesting. I'm not sure what to call this series. I will do some more if people find it interesting. Depends on the response to it. So if you thought this was interesting, if you thought it was cool, send it to someone who you think would like it. Send it to another reseller. Send it to a family member or a friend because this is really a type of video that I think that you would find interesting even if you don't really have a big interest in reselling. Uh, if you just like history, this type of thing helps you out. And I talk about this all the time. I love history. History is one of my favorite subjects. And if you have an appreciation of history, even if maybe you don't have it really that great right now, if you could develop that, I promise you it's a very good investment because that knowledge is going to help you out immensely in terms of making more money. So um, just keep reading, keep learning. There's so much to know out there, and it is uh, it is fun. It is fun, especially when you get into these cool little uh, subjects. So I'm going to try to come up with a little name for this series. If you have any ideas, put it down below. I might throw one in the title. I'm not sure. I haven't thought of that yet. Um, but uh, again, hope you enjoy it. If so, make sure that you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, especially if you are brand new. I have over 600 videos uh, to explore on the channel. Make sure you come by to my Facebook group, the Facebook Reselling Resource Center. And uh, follow me on Instagram as well. It's at prime underscore time underscore treasure. The links to all these things are down below. I will see you back at the next video, everyone. Take care.